What an introduction. <laughs> I'm Sean Tilden. I don't know what man about town means, but you know, <laughs> I'll take it. But um, <clears throat> happy Indigenous People Day. If you see us on the streets, if you see us in the corridors, in the dark hallways, if you see us in your kitchen, your restaurant, you know, know that we're still here. Anyway, I have a, a whole bunch of things. I have no idea what, where to start. <laughs> Being that it's Indigenous People's Day, I thought, you know, that I would introduce myself in my own language. <clears throat> Which would be um, <laughs> There's no hey. Yate <laughs> gently. Yate she is shanto yin shiedo torich in shle. Ashin he bashes chin do the sunness that should chee. Set not jenny that should nada. This is how I would introduce myself. My name is Shanto. I'm a member of the Bitterwater clan. Born for the Salt clan. Maternal grandfather. Many Goats clan, paternal Sinajini clan. So there would be a, per a protocol to any Diné meetings. And so I just um, wanted to introduce myself in that manner, at, uh, and, and so for you, allow you to hear language. Because language is still spoken. Very much. And if I can just find my right paper. Actually, what I need is my shades. <laughs> it's not a cool factor. I have to because of the lights. Okay. Okay. I have an older brother. I have an older brother still living out on the reservation. Community of Shanto out there, 125 miles away to the north and the east towards Kayenta, uh, out there on the lonely field of um, Black Mesa alluvial sands. He lived out there in a the little trailer. He's gone through a lot. And so I've always uh, thought that um, he deserves a little word. He never went to school. In the 1960s, uh, the native kids were rounded up. On the Navajo Nation, kids were rounded up. Parents had no choice. We had to be educated. We had to become Americanized. So it was enforced. And the kids, parents who uh, hid their kids were sent to jail. My parents spent many nights in jail. And um, subsequently, we were all herded into various boarding schools. It was Brutal institutions. It was a very brutal institution. Of the 13 boys I grew up with, very, very close, only three of us are alive. So it's, a, it's just a testament to a whole population of the walking traumas, still. I don't want to bum you out too early here, but, <laughs> but that's pretty much what it is. It's Indigenous Day. You gotta know these things. My brother went to jail for many years, and I want to give him some word. He was hidden from the government, and he was the only one that never went to school. He was hidden from the government effectively that the, they were not able to find him. So he stayed at home and took care of all the chores that needed to be done and herd sheep and all of that. And so he, he mastered no English language. He doesn't know how to write. And so he was pretty much in a prison of sort like we all are, in our own country, we still are. I have never been confined over three days, even in my teens, and I started hesitating in the face of danger, feel but anger and alcohol. I managed to avoid lengthy jail terms. Sometimes I wonder how that happened, why blessing and curses choose sides. My uneducated 
older brother now sits alone and scared in a state made hell south of Phoenix. He will be there for a couple of months. The federal trial in Prescott is set for early December. It is lonely and frightening even for us who are school. It must be pure hell for Bill. His world has turned gray and cold in midsummer. He didn't draw into his lung the smell of drought and breaking. Not this year. There will be no kneel down bread, no corn stew this year. There was no sound of Yebiche wailing into the indigo and cold night of summer. No second night flame casts shivering shadows. No, this is a new place, new times. I remember thinking back in the very old times when we were children, protected by child magic and blessed with memories. I can see the faces of those I shared these times with. My brother Bill, Tom, Nelson, older brother Flo. There were assorted cousins and neighbors, but cousins Cecil and Larry were always around, it seemed. Bill stood out among the group because he was tall and handsome with an easy grin that exhibited confidence. He was known to break wild horses with ease and look good doing it. We look to him as someone that we can lighten our loads, someone we can be seen with, someone we can set, sit, someone we can follow in and out of minor scrapes and laugh about it. We sat in peyote meetings together and moan in an all night chants. We offer pollen to the new beginnings upon many frozen dawns. Prayers leave the tongues in a small puff of steams. Bill drew pictures I was in awe of. He drew animals and machines like he knew them. He just knew. While we came home with carefree and loud ways, he remained calm and solid. He heard our stories with patience and sad memories of longing played in his eyes. And on the corner of his mouth behind him, he was separated from his brother back then. Only then we were the one behind hurricane fences, behind BIA boundaries, cocooned in gray cinder blocks, embracing scary nukes and venous and pains. I remember reaching out into the darkness for strength and familiarity. I yearned to hear those last wise words he imparted as we left him with the sheep camp once more. In those days, it was a different kind of fear and loneliness. The prison for him and those like him were constructed with bars of this new knowledge and language. We knew he was being left behind in spite of his strength. He remained vulnerable. Bill cared for appearance and cared himself and such while out in public. In his pressed jean and starched white shirt, he kept up with the trends with the sheep camp. Sometime he would appear mysteriously just out of reach at school and he was gone again. Sometime he would come to get us from the school when no adults were available. My brother was my friend and way back when I, would, when I knew him, I saw our world and formed opinion through his provincial eyes. One summer, when we returned from the boarding school, he was, at, he was not there to greet us. We blended into the summer, peering into the dusty horizon. He had gone off with a friend to work in a lettuce field of southern Arizona. A year later, he returned driving the first year used car in the family. Back then, we knew him as Bio. I guess it was my grandmother's pronunciation that prevailed, Bio. Back then, my grandmother spoke our names the way she understood them, and as such, we came up with somewhat exotic names. We also had Navajo war names uttered only in petition to the spirits. After his experience in the field, he carried himself a little bit more humble. His world saw reality in all its raw energy in forms of the city and its summers and its populate. He felt safer in the field with the brown people. After that summer, he never worked in a migrant farm again. We got a Ford Comet out of the heat. We got a Ford Comet out of a deal. <laughs> the old second, the old second night pony. It too sits somewhere immobile, stripped of its vital, half buried in the sand, sheltering only wayward tumbleweeds and lizards 
it too sets free from the tethers of emotion and responsibilities. It too holds stories. Long after the holes were punched under the side, gaping holes where dolls once glowed, encased in glass, long after the seats lost their covers and springs sprung free, and the rodents claimed the shell, it still holds stories. We held onto our old brothers up to a time he married into the very early 1970s. He was not an arranged marriage. The family and the clans benefited in this arrangement. They were all looking out for their, their own interests of the young, through the young couple, claiming land, grazing rights. I believe it was a selfish opportunity in the guise of quote unquote tradition. There was a good reasoning behind this practice way back in the warring days, back when greed still had very, was very much reviled. Having never spent a day in a classroom did not prevent him from dreaming in the face of inevitable, dream of conveniences. He fashioned out of parts out of scrap metals and custom made flatbed truck. He found his path in salvage and repair of local res vehicle. He still holds his own in the sheep camp out of mechanic community. Bill and my older brother moved a little further apart as the years rolled on by. Distances in our lives were filled by others in constant streams. We found our niches in social moments. My world were populated by, by bohemian, bohemians and cowboys, and later free spirit artists and lovers. I saw him turn into an older person I have known. The handsome young cowboy is replaced by an angrier man in full realization of what had was deprived him. My older brother receded into the past, except on days we crossed paths, a simple exchange of brotherly cordials and an awkward attempt of crude jokes. I saw him turning away from me too many times. A silent, arthritic limp carried him towards his aging, heavy truck, duty truck. I see his red oil-stained cap through the rear window past a 50-gallon drunk water drum. I see him burst into the light from the shade of a giant cottonwood grove. His wife, Rose, bouncing beside him. I want to see that strength and confidence again, if only through my dreams. I want to feel safe with him again. It will serve us well again. Bill, I wonder if you are coming in to get us from the boarding school this Friday. It is scary and very lonely here. The other one I want to read, but uh, for time constraint, I won't read it completely. But it was about you know religion being given religion by height. When I went to boarding school for the first time, I was five years old. They were forced from the back of the sheep. You were kidnapped literally into the back of a flat bat truck, and other kids were picked up. You were sent to boarding school from which you never saw your parents again for a full school year. And during those times, names were given us. Names were given us, birthdays were given us, religion was given us. We had no choice. Religion was given us by height. Lines were drawn on the wall. And if you were shorter than the lowest line, you were a Catholic. If you were up to the highest line, you were Mormons. And if you were in the middle, you were Presbyterian. So there was a religion by height. That's how I came to that particular uh, uh, theology. But I remember the very day that I outgrew Catholicism. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>